Good morning. What a blessing to be back with you folks. I, I've been here oh, several times, but not for quite a long time. So it's a blessing to be back with you. But before we look to God's word, let's pray together. Father, thank you uh, that we have this opportunity this morning to think about your word and to think about your love for us and your love for all people in Alaska. We pray that your Holy Spirit will will work in our hearts and draw us closer to you and then inspire us to be active in sharing your love with people throughout the state. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A while back, I got a text from somebody and they said, would Jesus have visited someone that had bed bugs? Well, I knew Jesus' character, and I knew that Jesus would go wherever there was a need, but I didn't know if they had bed bugs in Israel back in that time. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll look it up and see if I can find out if there's, there were bed bugs around Jesus' time. So I looked and looked, and I came across a story in an apocryphal book called The Acts of John. Now, that's not in the Bible, but it's a story about, about the travels of John when, when he was going out and, and sharing the good news. Well, the story says that John came to this little inn in this little town, and when he got there, he, he went to bed at night, and there were all these bed bugs that were bothering him. So John got up, and he said, I say to you, O bugs, behave yourselves one and all, and leave your abode for this night. Remain quiet in one place, and keep your distance from the servants of God. And the story goes, the bed bugs all jumped up, and they ran out of the house Remember, this is not in the Bible. This is just a story that somebody had from this time. And they, and they, they went outside of the, the, the house. Well, John went to sleep, and his, he and his companion slept really well that night. And it was a great night's sleep. And the next morning, his companions got up before John, and they opened the door, and here's all the bed bugs lined up at the, uh, at the doorway. And so they woke up John and said, John, look. And John said, okay, you've done your duty. And all the bed bugs crawled back in and jumped back into the little crevices and all the different places uh, inside of the bed. Now, the story is not very helpful, right? But it does remind us that there were bed bugs at the time of Jesus. So I'm sure that when Jesus traveled and he went to various places, there were places that he went where there are bed bugs. Now, how many of you really like bed bugs? Oh, not a whole lot of you. So, See, the thing is, is that, that Jesus went to places and dealt with people that we kind of go, ugh, you know, it's, it's not real comfortable for us. Um, Jesus was traveling in our story today. So I'm going to read from Luke chapter 17, verse 11 and 12. Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee on his way to Jerusalem. As he went into a village, ten men with a skin disease met him. They stood at a distance. Now, traditionally, that's called leprosy. We just talked about that this morning. Rachel told the kids that, that they had leprosy. Well, that word in the Bible that talks about leprosy is any of a number of skin diseases. Maybe not the Hansen's disease, the one that, that uh, you can't feel things, which is a terrible, awful curse for people to have. But whatever skin disease these people had, they couldn't hang around with other people, other Jews especially, because they were considered unclean. They were people you had to keep your distance from because we didn't want to get the disease that they had. And so they would sometimes congregate in groups. Well, I thought about that. Who are the lepers? Who are the people in our society? Who are the people that kind of have to stay a distance from us, that we're a little uncomfortable being close to, maybe for different reasons? Are they the, the, the drug users? Maybe we don't stay away from them because they're, they're unclean, but maybe we feel a little bit threatened by them. People that are meth users or, or the huge heroin uh, addiction problem. We in the, the Copper Valley have a, a problem with, uh, with heroin. We had two people in the last few months that have passed away from, from overdoses of heroin. But we, you know, we think, man, they're, they're, they're a hard group of people for us. Maybe we'll let the professionals work with those folks because we're, we're afraid to get close to them. Or maybe they're, they're the street people we drive by on the road. You know, as I drove in Anchorage, I saw lots of folks on the side of the road. And almost all the cars, a few of them maybe handed out a piece of fruit or, or uh, looked at the people. Very few of them even wave. Most people just keep their eyes straight forward so they, they don't have to, to look at those people because they make us feel a little bit 
uncomfortable. Uh, we don't invite them into our houses. They aren't people that we say, hey, you know, come out and hang out with me very often. Or maybe they're the, the people that we work with in Copper Center, the, the chronic alcoholics, the people that are not wanting to go to AA and trying to, to recover. They're just, they've been in this for a long, long time, and it looks like they're going to be that way for the rest of their life. And they're hard because they, they, they are so addicted, uh, and they don't always act the way that we would like them to, to behave. You know, they, they, they don't clean themselves because alcohol has become so important in their lives. You know, I heard that what you have to do is wait for people to hit rock bottom. But that doesn't always work. We have um, lots of people in our community that struggle with alcohol, and oftentimes when they hit rock bottom, they die. In one short period of time, in about two years period of time, we had seven people in our Copper Center area. That's a small community. Maybe, you know, if, if you take the whole valley, you're talking 2,000 people. But they died of alcohol-related effects. So we try to reach into people's lives to love them and to say, hey, look, maybe you don't have to wait until you die to wake up. So we try to reach and share the gospel with those people. Because those are some of the people that are, are hard for us to, to reach out to and to connect with. Let's continue on with the text. The lepers stood at a distance and they shouted, Jesus, teacher, have mercy on us. They cried out to Jesus for help. Now, obviously, they knew Jesus' name, but we don't know what they knew about him. Maybe they knew that he could heal, or maybe, because this is a common thing that people would say at the time, they just wanted some help. Here's this guy coming along. He's a rabbi, and rabbis often give alms. They give things to the poor. So maybe they were just saying, hey, you know, we need a little bit of money. Just kind of like the guys on the street yesterday as I was driving by. They, you drive by them, and they hold a little sign. Any, anything helps? Come on, help me out. What can you do for me? Then, when, when he saw them, when Jesus saw them, he told them, show yourselves to the priests. Now, it's interesting. When Jesus says this to them, they weren't healed yet. So Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. And they look down, and they still have leprosy. It's kind of like us. I heard pastors say, your sins are forgiven. And maybe you look down and said, they are? It doesn't seem like anything has changed. It, it, it feels like things are exactly the same that they were before. And these guys maybe felt that. They said, go show ourselves to the priest. What good is that going to do? We still have this skin disease. Showing ourselves to the priest isn't going to make a difference. But in faith, they turned and they went. And as they went, the Bible says, what happened? You tell me. They were cleansed, right? It changed. All of a sudden, a miracle happened. And as we go, we realize that what the pastor said is actually true. Your sins are forgiven. When you confess your sins before our Lord, he says to you, you are forgiven. And that's a fact. And that miracle takes place. And as you go, you know that you are forgiven. But that's not the only miracle that God does. He does miracles in people's lives all over the state. Now, I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm not going to tell you the name of the person, because we're all in Alaska, and maybe somebody knows somebody that knows them. Uh, but there was a, a woman in our community, and she was, you know, if, if you'd have picked the 10 least likely people to get off of uh, alcohol and to get out of, of that kind of lifestyle, she probably would have been number one or number two. Uh, she just was, was not the kind of person that you thought had very much hope at all. Um, she wanted to get, to get clean, but it, it just, she, she was just, just one of those people that it seemed like was never, ever going to have an opportunity to be, uh, to be free. She, in fact, she was on that show. How many of you have seen the show, uh, the Alaska Troopers show? Yeah. You know, they, I, I'm not sure I like that show because it kind of, uh, make, it's kind of a voyeuristic show. But they came to her house one time in one of the episodes, and they were knocking on the door and doing a welfare check. Now, she wasn't the kind of person that you thought was going to get better, but the Lord reached into her life. And it wasn't through things necessarily that we did, but it was through things that he did. And it ended up, she had decided she was going to try to get clean, didn't work, so she went back into her old lifestyle, and she was living with, uh, with some guys. And one night, things got really bad there. There was some violence that happened, and she was very poorly dressed, and she decided in the middle of a winter snowstorm she was going to go home. So she started walking down the highway. Well, there's a bridge between her home and there on the, uh, going over the Taslina River. 
And as she was going across that bridge, a young man was driving his car, 16-year-old boy, and hit her. When I got the call, I thought, I thought, oh no, she's gone, because they didn't tell me what, what the results were. They just said, get up here quick to the hospital. So I drove up to the, to the clinic, and as I got up to the clinic, she was, uh, she was still alive. And then we started to talk with her, and we prayed with her, and she was, slowly was healing. They brought her here into town and put her into one of those uh, assisted living places. And the Lord started to work in her life, and, and she said, you know, I want to do something different. So the community, not just our church, but all came together and started to raise support to be able to send her to a long-term Christian treatment center outside. And the community did fundraisers and, and did one of those GoFundMe things to be able to send her down. And it actually worked. She went down outside and she learned about God's word. And the biggest miracle is not that she is a year and a half sober, but the biggest miracle is that now she is walking with Jesus. And every day she is, she's reading her Bible and she is loving that forgiveness that the Lord has given her. It's a transformation that the Lord did in her life. Because he does that kind of thing in people's lives. When one of them saw that he was healed, this is back to the text, he turned back and praised God in a loud voice. He quickly bowed at Jesus' feet and thanked him. This man was a Samaritan. This wasn't the expected man, but he came back and he gave thanks. And it reminds me that it's important for us as we do the Lord's work to always turn back and give thanks to him for the work that he's doing. We're very thankful for this woman and the way that the Lord's worked in her life, but that's not the only thing that we're thankful for. I'd like to tell you a story of a, a young man Last year at VBS, he had real long hair, uh, about 10 years old at the time, and he was in our VBS, and he came, but he was a real nice kid. Well, after VBS, I didn't see him until I was driving around the village in about September, and he had his hair cut, and I hardly recognized him, and I stopped my car, and I said, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? And he said, hey, I'm, I'm doing great. You know, I've had perfect attendance in school this year. I thought, well, that's pretty good. This is September. He's had about three weeks of school, and he's been in... in <laughs> that's not bad. I said, well, you know, that's great. So why don't you work on having perfect attendance at church? He'd never been to church before, but I thought, you know, I just threw that out there towards him. Well, the next week, he shows up in church. And as he shows up in church, he sees us doing the Lord's Supper. He says, what's that all about? I said, well, we have a class. We do early communion, so we have a class. If you'd like to come, you can come, and I'll, I will teach you about what the Lord's Supper is. And as he came, you know, he found out, I, I discovered he wasn't baptized. And he said, well, I, I want to be baptized. So we said, okay, that's great. In November, we brought him into our barn. And, and you know that as Lutherans, we have the freedom to baptize with just a little bit of water or a lot of water. We decided that he wanted to be baptized, immersed, because it's the, of the picture of, of dying with Christ and coming back to life again. So we took him into the fire barn. It was in the middle of the winter, November. And we, we put water in a stock tank. And we baptized him. Now, one of the other people that was there was another little boy that had been at the VBS program last summer. And he said, you know what? I want to do that. I said, well, do you know what, what happened? What that was about? God adopted him as his child and, and brought him into his kingdom. And uh, this guy, a, a little nine-year-old boy, but he's really small, he said, yeah, I, I, I want to do that too. So I talked to him, and he, I said, you've got to talk to your parents. See, this, these kids have been coming without their parents to, to church. I said, well, you've got to talk to your parents. He doesn't live with his parents. He lives with his grandparents. So he talked to his grandparents, and they said, nah. And he kept talking to his grandparents and said, no, I, I, I really want to be baptized. And they said, well, I don't know. And he said, no, no, I, I really want to be baptized. I really want to be adopted by Christ. I really want to be in the kingdom of God. And they said, okay. Okay, we'll do that. So the week after Easter this year, we brought a littler stock tank in because he's a very little boy and brought it into the back of the, of the church and we baptized him and he came into the kingdom of, of God. Now, isn't that a, a, something to be thankful for? To see how God is working in, the, in these lives of these young people as a result of the work of the Vacation Bible School. I know this summer you're going to have a team that's going to come up here and come alongside you. But that Vacation Bible School isn't just a, a neat little thing to do for kids but it has results for the kingdom of God as God works through his word and calls people to himself. Of the baptisms that I've done in Copper Center, over a third of them have been a direct result of our VBS, which most of the kids that come to are in the community. So we reach into kids that otherwise wouldn't have that opportunity. And it's a great opportunity to work then from the kids into the rest of the family and let them know of the love that Jesus has for them. 
another thing that we're very thankful for, this today in the community of Tatlin, Tatlin has not had regular worship services. But today, our missionary in Tok and in that area is beginning regular weekly worship services in the community of Tatlin at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Praise God. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be thankful for? We, in another community down in Seldovia, and some of you are familiar with Seldovia, we've had an outreach in Seldovia for quite a few years, but it had kind of struggled the last uh, couple of years. And, and there were only one or two people that were coming, and the pastor that was going over there thought, what am I going over here for? It's a, a lot of resources for very few people. Well, some people were talking about, well, let's, let's just get rid of that. Let's just stop that, that, uh, that outreach and, and let somebody else worry about it. Well, about a year or so ago, the Catholic Church said, we're getting out of Seldovia. It's not enough people for us. So what we'd like to do is to give you guys the building, the, the church building in Seldovia. And we said, well, is this the Lord's opportunity for us to do more ministry? Do we have somebody that's willing to go? Well, another pastor on the Kenai Peninsula, Peninsula, um, Pastor Andy, said, oh, I I can do that. My kids are all grown up. I can go. I've got time to be able to go over on a regular basis to Seldovia. And so since then, he's been going over and using this building that the Catholics have given us. And slowly, that community has started to grow. I don't know what the long-term outcome is going to become of that, but thank the Lord for the good things that he's doing as he reaches into people's lives in little communities like Seldovia. Somewhere, my notes disappeared up here, but the, the other other one that is um, is something that we want to be thankful for is just this past, just a, a week ago, um, we had call service at the two seminaries. And our, a man was called to be our missionary to southeast Alaska and to serve the little congregation in Juneau. He's been called to be able to come out there and serve. For quite a few years, we haven't had anybody down in that part of the state. We haven't been able to follow up on the mission opportunities that teams have been doing down there. We have vacation Bible schools, and we have people reaching out in those communities, but we haven't been able to follow up. Now the Lord has provided someone to go down there and to do that work. And he's going to be coming, um, hopefully, as soon as he raises enough support, he'll be able to come up and to be able to do that work in southeast Alaska. Another place to just give thanks to God for his wonderful, wonderful work that he does for us. I have this, it's, uh, I have no idea. Oh, it fell on the floor. That's where it goes. <laughs> All right, let's continue. The, the reason I have the notes up here most important is that I've, I've printed the Bible verses a little bit bigger. I always used to preach out of this Bible but the print is so small that now I, it's, the problem is I don't have long enough arms to read it. So, okay. Jesus asked, weren't ten men made clean? Where are the other nine? Only this foreigner came back to praise God. Jesus told the man, get up and go home. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. All of the, of the men with the skin disease were healed as they went to the priest. But one turned around and came back and gave thanks to God because of something that was inside him. The Holy Spirit had worked faith in his heart. And because of that faith in his heart, he received something more than the others did. He received that relationship with Jesus and that forgiveness of sins. The others were saved from their leprosy, were saved from their skin disease. But he was saved from his sin. And that is the thing. That's the reason why we have Alaska Mission for Christ. That's the reason why we do the work that we do. That's the reason why you guys are here. Why Anchorage Lutheran Church is here. Because we want everybody to have that wonderful knowledge that God has forgiven our sins. And restored our relationship with him. So that we will be with him forever. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be thankful for? And I am so thankful for that. So I ask you, you've been such a wonderful blessing to Alaska Mission for Christ over the, the years, supporting us uh, with teams that have come from here, as well as your financial support, and most importantly, with your prayers. And I just ask you to please continue to do that as we try to make a bold proclamation for Jesus in every community in Alaska. Um, let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your wonderful love for each and every one of us. 
thank you uh, for cleansing us of our sin. And thank you for all the wonderful ways in which you're working to reach out to people in this state of Alaska. We pray that your words that have gone into our heart will be an encouragement to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.